Heavenly Father, I thank you, Father, for the work that has been done through the the hands and the feet of those serving here, Father. What began as an idea that you planted in our hearts has materialized into this gathering, Father, over a very short period of time, Father. What a testimony to you, to your strength, to your wisdom, to your grace and to your mercy to us. That you would call the likes of us, not only to know you, Father, but to serve you. I thank you for this gathering, Father. I thank you for each man and woman who has stepped into this room tonight to sit at your feet and to hear your word. I pray, Father, that you would speak to each man and woman here tonight. You would teach that your spirit would open ears and eyes, that the text would be revealed to us in new ways. And, Father, I pray that you would achieve these things through the weakness of the man who stands before them, Father. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. And if it sounds as if I'm mispronouncing any of the names in this genealogy, just understand that I'm right and you're wrong. (laughs) Only I wish that were true. Okay, let's go. Matthew 1, 1. The record of the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah was the father of Perez and Sarah of Tamar. Perez was the father of Hezron and Hezron the father of Ram. Ram was the father of Amnibadad. Amnibadad was the father of Nashon and Nashon the father of Salmon. Salmon was the father of Boaz by Rahab. Boaz was the father of Obed by Ruth and Obed the father of Jesse. Jesse was the father of David the king. David was the father of Solomon by Bathsheba, who had been the wife of Uriah. Solomon was the father of Rehoboam. Rehoboam, the father of Abijah. Abijah, the father of Asa. Asa was the father of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat, the father of Joram. And Joram, the father of Uzziah. Uzziah was the father of Jotham. Jotham, the father of Ahaz. And Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah. Hezekiah was the father of Manasseh. Manasseh, the father of Ammon, and Ammon, the father of Josiah. Josiah became the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the deportation to Babylon. After the deportation to Babylon, Jeconiah became the father of Shealtiel, and Shealtiel, the father of Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel was the father of Abihud, Abihud, the father of Eliakim, Eliakim, the father of Azor, and Azor was the father of Zadok, Zadok, the father of Achim, And Achim, the father of Eliud. Eliud was the father of Eleazar. Eleazar, the father of Mathan. Mathan, the father of Jacob. Jacob was the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, by whom Jesus was born, who is called the Messiah. So, all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. From David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. And from the deportation to Babylon to the Messiah, 14 generations. Beginning a study of any of the four Gospels in our Bible, it always requires some preliminary observations. So that's what we're going to spend a little bit of our time tonight doing. And during the three plus years that Jesus ministered on earth, there were tens of thousands of people who witnessed his miracles and heard his teachings. So theoretically, you and I could have many accounts of Jesus having been written by those eyewitnesses. But Only the Holy Spirit can inspire or lead someone to author Scripture. Peter tells us this plainly in his letter, 2 Peter 1.20. He says, Know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever written by an act of human will, but by men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. So what you have in your Bible, you have because God moved someone to write it. And in God's providence, only four men were moved by the Spirit to author an account of Jesus' life on earth. And those four accounts are the first four books in our New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, not to be confused with John, Paul, George, and Ringo. And if you don't get that joke, it means you're under the age of 50. So the first three of these Gospels in our Bible, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are structured very similarly, and you probably know this if you've read them at all, They all report the events of Jesus' life on earth, all ending with his death and resurrection. And so naturally, these three Gospels are going to talk about similar things, describing similar events, as you would expect. And they're often called the synoptic 
Gospels. The first three have that title because they are so similar in their perspective. The word synoptic in Greek, it just means to see together. And the Gospels, in the case of the first three, are called synoptic because those authors all shared a very similar view of Jesus' life. But what's really interesting is that two of those three authors were not disciples of Jesus. They never knew him while he walked the earth. Matthew was one of the twelve apostles, yes. But Luke and Mark, they became Christians only after Jesus ascended into heaven. You would ask then, how can Luke and Mark have seen the same things that Matthew did see? Well, the answer is that they're reporting things through the eyes of others. Specifically, Mark was a traveling companion of the apostle Peter while Peter did his missionary work. And Luke was the companion of the Apostle Paul. So what Mark wrote in his gospel is what Peter related to him from Peter's own experiences with Jesus, accompanying Jesus before Jesus' death and resurrection. And then what Luke wrote in his gospel, he received from Paul, and what Paul received he gained from the encounters that he had with Jesus after Jesus' resurrection. So the first three gospels are similar. Because they record the experiences of three men, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, who were all eyewitnesses or influenced by eyewitnesses to the events of Jesus' life. But having said that, these three are not identical. It wouldn't take you very long if you read through them to detect the differences. And that has caused some people to question their trustworthiness. For example, only Matthew and Luke's Gospels have genealogies, like the one we just opened with tonight. But when you look at those two pieces, the genealogies of Matthew and Luke, they're different. And you would hardly expect genealogies to be different, would you? And there are other differences across the first three Gospels. And all of these differences would cause someone to wonder, perhaps, can you really trust these accounts if they have these kinds of differences? And in particular, for our study tonight, we should ask, why are those genealogies different? Well, before I address the question of the genealogies, let's just consider that general question of, why are there differences at all? And what does that say about the Gospels? Well, I want you to imagine something for a moment. I want you to imagine that the first three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, I want you to imagine they were identical. I want you to imagine that they were literally, word for word, the same. You could read one, you've read all three. Would there be any value in that? Would there be any value in having the first three books of the New Testament be identical works? And for that matter, why would God want to inspire such repetition in the early parts of the New Testament? And in fact, wouldn't that perfection, that similarity, wouldn't it cause you to be suspicious? A little bit? I mean, wouldn't you assume that one author is just copying the other guys? Or if the books were exactly the same, wouldn't you feel a little less certain about their inspiration and not more confident about their inspiration? I think that's exactly what the Lord is doing in these three Gospels. He intentionally allows each man's personality and their memory differences and their perspective differences to play a part in the formation of the story of the Gospel, yet without making mistakes or yet without having contradictions. And in doing so, you actually gain greater confidence in the accuracy of what you have before you. Because I want you to imagine another scenario for a moment. What if you were a detective and you came upon some crime scene, you're investigating the crime, you have four witnesses to the crime, and you interview all four witnesses. I want you to imagine each one tells you exactly the same story word for word. No differences. Well, would you find that reassuring? Or would you find that cause for suspicion? Right? If their stories were identical, wouldn't you assume they prearranged their testimonies and that they're hiding something as a result? That's why they went to the effort to prearrange? We know this, right? We've watched the cop shows. Anytime they have the same story, something's wrong. Right? It's actually evidence of a conspiracy. And in fact, in true police work, detective work, if two witnesses have identical testimonies, they think of it immediately as a conspiracy. Because it's not natural. Instead, what you expect is that each person's perspective is going to vary at least slightly, and they're going to have different memories, they're going to have seen different things, they're going to recall different things. One person might recall one thing, another person recall another. But in the end, what the detective gains by having four witnesses is they assimilate what they hear from all four, put them together, and you actually end up with a better understanding of what happened than you would have if you'd only had one witness to the whole scene. Having multiple perspectives gives you a better understanding. And the differences will serve to fill gaps that were present in somebody else's testimony. That's how you have to see the four Gospels that open our Bible, not just the first three. That's exactly why the Lord gave us four perspectives on Jesus' life and on his words. Because having those different perspectives adds authenticity to the accounts, and it gains us the benefit of more information, of filling in those gaps.
Plus, it allowed the Lord to tailor each author's presentation to fit the needs of a particular audience. Each gospel author, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all wrote essentially on the events of Jesus' life, but they all did it from a very unique perspective. Many have noted that Mark wrote primarily to the Romans of his day and that Luke wrote primarily to a wide Gentile audience, while Matthew wrote to the Jews who were dispersed throughout the Roman Empire in his day. And then you have John's Gospel. It's very different from the other three because John wrote his much later, decades later than the first three. And he did it from a hindsight that understood there were some things the other guys forgot. And so his gospel has a lot of things the other ones don't have for that reason. So when you find, when we go into this study of Matthew and we find something in Matthew that's different from what you might find about that same scene elsewhere in the other three gospels, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to do what the detective would have done. We're going to accept the reality that one of these authors noticed or remembered things that the other guys overlooked, and we're going to assimilate what we're learning across these Gospels. And if we do that and we come to a point where it seems as though one is directly contradicting the other so that they can't both be true, then what are we going to do? Well, we're going to work from the assumption that both accounts are true, and we're going to seek to reconcile them. And you know what happens when you do that? That is, when you hold the authenticity and the authority of Scripture high, When you have a high view of Scripture, you stop worrying about explaining it away, God shows you how to reconcile them. God shows you the things He won't show those who are too proud to seek Him, who are not ready to concede to the truth of His Word before they know the answer. We're going to do that in here. We're going to understand it knowing it's true. And we can do this safely, friends, because we know this Word is inspired by God, as Peter said. The same God who spoke this universe into existence, spoke these words too. He just used a man to record them for us. The same God who designed the forces of nature and gave life to everything and made the sun rise every morning for our benefit, He has shared His thoughts with you and I in this book. That's how much respect we ought to give to it. That's how much respect we will give to it. There is no misplaced word in this book. There is nothing approximate Nothing is in error. Everything is in harmony. I hope that's your attitude about the Word of God. Perhaps I'm preaching to a a large choir on this point. After all, we are verse-by-verse fellowship. But I don't know all of you, and I don't know who may be here tonight for the first time and be introduced to Bible study for the first time. I want you to understand that's the perspective that we come to this work with, an appreciation for who wrote it. So, friends, if we can't make sense of something here, it's not because the Bible lacks sense. It's because we lack understanding. And the Bible was written by an omniscient God. He has given it to finite minds like you and me. And so we should not expect that we can absorb everything that an infinite God can provide to us, certainly not in the first sitting. If you submit to the Word of God, you allow the Spirit to instruct you in it, the Lord's going to make things clear in time. I assure you of that. I have studied through the Bible in different times, different ways, many different times in my experience, and there are new things every time I open it, and I correct things I thought I knew before. That's the nature of what God is at work doing. He delights to reveal himself to those who sit at his feet. One of my favorite quotes from the New Testament is is in Luke 10, where Jesus, talking to the Father in his own prayer to the Father, says this. He says in Luke 10, 21, he says, I praise you, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent, and you have revealed them to infants. Do you know who he was talking about? You, me. We're the infants in that analogy, right? We're not the wise ones. And the Father, and he goes on to say, Yes, Father, for this was well-pleasing in your sight. So how do we understand the genealogy I just read, presented here in Matthew? What's its reason to exist? Well, both Matthew and Luke, as I mentioned earlier, record genealogies of Jesus. And interestingly, Matthew and Luke are also the only two Gospels that record any details of Jesus' birth story. And it kind of makes sense, right? The two authors that have an interest in the birth of Jesus are also the two authors who want us to understand his genealogy. So the two are connected. But you know what? It turns out that that connection also explains why the two genealogies are different. I want you to remember Matthew's connection to Jesus. Matthew is one of the 12 disciples of Jesus that were elevated at a certain point to apostle. He's one of the original 12 apostles. So like the other apostles that Jesus uh, appointed, he was introduced to Jesus near the beginning of Jesus' ministry right after the baptism of John. That's when these guys first got to know Jesus and began to follow him for about three years. Before that, Jesus spent roughly 30 years on earth, living, working in obscurity. 
He lived in this backwater area of Judea that today we know as the Galilee. And at that time, this was the place you went to disappear. This is where you went to be invisible. So even if Jesus and Matthew had crossed paths at some point in those earlier 30 years, you know, just by chance, Matthew wouldn't have given Jesus a second look. He wouldn't have known who he was, wouldn't have cared. So neither Matthew, and for that matter, Luke either, neither of those guys had firsthand knowledge of Jesus' birth, much less his family genealogy. They would never have known him that time in his life. So again, how did they get all that information about his birth? Well, if you compare those two Gospels, Matthew and Luke, and you compare what they say in their two accounts, it becomes clear that they were written from two different perspectives. For example, in Matthew's Gospel, what we're going to find as we study the birth story here are are a bunch of intimate details on Joseph's experience. But if you go over and you look at Luke, Luke has all these intimate details on Mary's experience. And secondly, in Matthew's account, you're going to notice that we're given descriptions of what Joseph is thinking. But in Luke's account, you find out what Mary was thinking. And in Matthew's account, you have descriptions of what the angel told Joseph, but you don't hear any mention at all of an angel appearing to Mary. In Luke's account, you have an angel appearing to Mary, no mention of an angel appearing to Joseph. You see the pattern? So evidently, Joseph was Matthew's source for the backstory on Jesus' birth, while Mary was Luke's source on the backstory of the birth. And so naturally, each author's account reflects the perspective of that source, which is what you would normally expect, right? And for that same reason, the genealogy in Matthew is the genealogy of Joseph's family, and the genealogy in Luke is the genealogy of Mary's family. Mary was likely still alive when Luke wrote his gospel. He could have interviewed her, presumably. While Matthew probably got Joseph's account secondhand because most assume that Joseph was not alive at the point when Jesus began his ministry. There's just no mention of him. And that seems odd, so it leads people to assume he was dead. Perhaps he was, perhaps he wasn't. But in any case, you could have assumed Matthew could have gone to his family. For that matter, he could have gone to Jesus' half-brothers. Because if you remember, Mary and Joseph had other sons. So he could have interviewed them. Anyway, knowing this, we now look at Matthew's genealogy, understanding that he's telling a story from Joseph's perspective. Not the father of Jesus, of course, but the husband of Mary. Let's look at the genealogy itself. And, you know, we could spend all night looking at every name. That would just be terrible. I'm not going to do that. That's not how you study a genealogy, not unless you're very interested in the history of each of those names, and that's not our purpose. A genealogy, though, is, it's like a family tree, right? We all know what these are. It just lists generations in a family over time. Many people today are really interested in this kind of stuff. There's, there's websites now you can sign up for to learn your ancestry and go you know, tearing back through history to find out who your family is. Let me suggest to you that's not always a good idea. Um, you, you know, we're all drawn at first to the mystery of that, of wondering, well, what famous, wonderful people are in my background? Well, it's not always that way, right? As someone once said, it's not the size of your family tree that matters, it's how many nuts you find along the way. And, <laughs> but let's take a different perspective on genealogies for a minute. For a Jew, remember, Matthew's a Jew, Jesus is a Jew, he's writing to Jews. For a Jew, keeping genealogy records wasn't just a hobby, it's a crucial part of being Jewish, Because God assigned the Jewish nation a special place among all the nations of the world. And he made covenants with that people. And he gave promises to that people. And now those covenants and promises are inherited, as it were, down these lines of the family. And the most important promise that God gave to Israel was to bring a Messiah, a Savior, not just for them, but for the whole world, and to do it through their people, through their line. So it was all important for the Jewish people to maintain this understanding of who was truly Jewish. And genealogical records were kept for that very purpose. I'll give you a simple example from their history. When the Jews were preparing to come back from Babylon and reestablish themselves in the land of Judah, in the land of, of Israel, after God had kicked them out for a time, for 70 years, there comes that point where they're ready to come back. But they've been living and, and intermingling to some extent with those in Babylon. And so there comes a point where they have to prove they're Jewish before they're allowed to come back. And I'll just read a couple verses from Ezra. That's the book that covers the return. And in Ezra 2.59, you hear this. Ezra says, Now these are those who came up from Tel Malaya and Tel Harsha, Cherub, Adan, and Emer. But they were not able to give evidence of their father's household and their descendants of whether they were of Israel. They searched among their ancestral registration, but they could not be located. Therefore, they were considered unclean and excluded from the priesthood. 
They're pretty hardcore about this stuff, right? It's not just fun anymore, is it? If you claim to be a Jew, much less a priest or an heir to the throne of David, you didn't just say you were, you had to prove it. And you proved it through a genealogical record. And so the Jews kept scrupulous records of genealogy of every tribe, and they stored these records and preserved them in the temple in Jerusalem, like a library of Congress. And it was open to the public for the Jew to go in there and look at your genealogical records, look at someone else's records. So what Matthew does is he opens his gospel, his story of Jesus, is to tell you his genealogy on Joseph's side, and he does it to prove something, to prove Jesus' claims. Now, you and I might look at this and wonder, well, is it true? How do we know he got the right genealogy? Well, remember when he wrote this, he wrote this before the temple was destroyed. So there's no reason to doubt his genealogy because in his day, it would have been so easy for anyone to validate whether he got this right. Anyone could have just walked into the, any Jew could have walked into the archives and looked up Jesus's or Joseph's uh, genealogy. And if there had been anything wrong with this, it would have been shown to be such very easily. And yet we have no historical evidence of anyone ever disputing the genealogy in Matthew. So if someone wanted to tear this down, they could have easily done it. But they couldn't do it because it was correct. So this is a correct genealogy of Joseph. So as you look at the names in the list, the question we have to answer with the time we have tonight is, what was Matthew trying to prove here about Jesus through this genealogy? We find our answer by starting with a few observations of the names in the list. First, you see in verse 2, the list begins with Abraham. Matthew uses the man's covenant name, Abraham. That's not his given name. His given name was Abram. Remember that? Back in verse 1, Matthew introduces the genealogy by calling it the record of Jesus, the son of Abraham. Now, God made a covenant with Abram originally, and he promised this man he was going to bring a nation of people from his seed, that is, from his family line, and that through this line, God said, he would bring a certain seed, a certain person, to bless all nations, both Jewish and Gentile. And, of course, we know that that was a promise of Jesus. And in marking that covenant, God changed the man's name from Abram to Abraham. He inserted a part of his own name, God's own name, in the middle of Abraham's name. Yahweh is the name of God. He put the ha in the middle of Abram's name, Abraham. And that's a way of saying we're united in this covenant. So by beginning the genealogy with Abraham and calling Jesus the son of Abraham, Matthew's making a pretty clear statement to the Jew. He's testifying, this guy, Jesus, he's the fulfillment of what God spoke to Abraham and said would be coming one day. He's that seed. He's that son. But you notice in verse 1, he also says that Jesus is the son of David. Did you catch that? Now, why mention David's name at all? And even more interestingly, why put David's name in front of Abraham? That doesn't seem very Jewish. If you know anything about Jewish custom, they always think of the father as having greater authority than the son. And that goes back as many generations as you want. So Abraham had greater authority than anyone who came from Abraham, to include David. But here, it's reversed. Now, once again, David's notable because of a covenant. God made a covenant with David as well. And he promised David something very specific. He said that there would always be a dynasty over Israel, a king, and that dynasty would always have a descendant of David occupying the throne. And the Lord promised him that one day he would raise up a ruler in his family line who would rule perpetually. No one would ever take the throne away from this guy. And he wouldn't just rule Israel, he'd rule the world. And therefore, Matthew inserts David's name before Abraham's name because he wants us to understand that this Jesus doesn't just fulfill one, he fulfills the other. He is the son of David, meaning he is the promised king coming in fulfillment of that covenant, the Davidic covenant. And he is the son of Abraham because he is the promised seed to bless all nations, not just Israel, but also the Gentiles. And he puts them in this order for a couple of reasons. One I'll give you now, one I'll give you later. The first answer is because the Davidic covenant is uniquely Jewish. It is for the Jewish people, whereas the Abrahamic covenant is for all peoples. So he puts the Jewish segment first and then the one that covers Gentiles secondly. We have the one reason to show that he is the fulfillment of Abraham's covenant. Second reason is to show you that he's the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. Third reason, Matthew tells us in verse 17, notice he says, I've arranged this genealogy into three groups of 14 names. Now, I'll do some homework for you. If you compare this genealogy to genealogies in the Old Testament that cover these same families in these same periods of time. You know what you're going to find? You're going to find that Matthew intentionally left some names out. There are grandfathers and great-grandfathers skipped in this list at various points along the way. And then Matthew adds four names you wouldn't expect to find in this genealogy. 
So there are five kings missing in Joseph's family line. And then you have four women that have been added. And I say that's unusual because typically in Jewish ways of doing things, they would not have had women in the line. They used the man as the head of the home and marked him alone. Here again, hearing that he has missing names in the genealogy, that might have set up a red flag for you, right? Okay, wait a minute. This is bogus now. He's got names that are missing. But that's just not unusual for Jewish way of counting genealogy. Skipping a generation here or there in a genealogy was common and it didn't invalidate it at all. Jews understood that jumping over a generation didn't invalidate a genealogy so long as the other names on either side of it were accurate. I mean, for example, if I skipped your grandfather in your family tree, but I included your great-grandfather and I included your father correctly, well, then your genealogy is still accurate. There's just a, a missing space in it. That's all. All right, so Jews commonly did this. They would commonly leave out names here and there. They did it for symmetry, and they did it to provide commentary on the family tree. Now, in Matthew's case, he wants to do both. He wants symmetry, and he wants to say something about this genealogy to you. So he drops some of Jesus' ancestors, and in doing so, it allows him to have three groups of a perfect number of 14 each. That's what he wanted. If he had put all the names in there, it wouldn't have worked out to 14 times 3. And you and I are thinking, that seems like a pretty weird thing to be worried about when you're just trying to trace genealogy, right? He's got to get all the numbers just right on the way down. And then you have the second problem. He inserted these four women. Well, the the names were dropped for symmetry and the women were added to make a commentary. These two ideas form the themes for his entire gospel. And you're going to see them clearly in verse 1. First, Matthew wants us to see that Jesus is the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant, as I mentioned earlier. Hebrew names can be assigned numeric values in the way Jews did things. They have every letter in their alphabet assigned a numeric value. The first 10 are numbered 1 through 10. And then they number the next ones 20, 30, 40, 50. And then the last few, they number 100, 200, 300, and onward. If you take someone's name and assign the numeric value for each letter in their name, and then add those values up, you come to a number. This is, by the way, how we get to the number of the beast, 666. His name in Hebrew, when added up, will add up to that number. Do you know what Jesus' name is when it's spelled out in Hebrew? It adds up to 749. 7, 7 times 7. And if you add up the Hebrew numbers in the name of David, you arrive at 14. And so Matthew has arranged his genealogy into three groups of 14 because in Hebrew thinking, one is good, two is better, three is best. And so by the repetition of 14, Matthew is pointing out David to us. It's as if David is just screaming at us in this genealogy from the way a Hebrew would understand it. That Jesus is the eternal David. Jesus is the promised king. 14, 14, 14, get the point. In fact, notice in verse 17, Matthew connects the first group and the second group by mentioning David again. There were 14 generations between Abraham and David, 14 more from David to Babylon. You can't help but notice his prominence in this list. And then he says there were 14 generations from the Babylon captivity until Jesus. Now that tells you that there was 14 generations to get to David, 14 generations until there was no king on the throne in Judah, and then 14 more generations before a king returned to the throne for Judah. Now the question is, would Israel receive him or not? You see how he marked that very clearly with 14? That's the first point. David's king has come. It is Jesus. And then secondly, Matthew draws our attention to Jesus fulfilling the Abrahamic promise once more. He does that with those four women. You may recognize those names. Rahab, obviously, Ruth, and so on. These four women were all Gentiles. You may not know that in the case of a couple of them, but they were. Tamar was a Gentile. Tamar and Rahab were Canaanites. Ruth was a Moabitess, and Bathsheba was a Hittite. All four of these women were Gentiles. And three of these women were guilty of sexual sin of one kind or another. Matthew includes four Gentile women, most of not great reputation, in Jesus' genealogy to testify Jesus fulfills God's promise to Abraham to save Gentiles too. He didn't just come for the Jews, and he didn't just come for the upright or the pharisaically pure. He came for everyone. And notice again how the second and third groups of 14 are connected by the mentioning of the Babylonian captivity. Well, the Babylonian captivity was a result of Israel's rebellion against the Lord. And through two prophets, David and Jeremiah, we're told 
that at the time of the Babylonian captivity, God had inaugurated a period called the Age of the Gentiles, a period in which God was purposely going to look for the Gentile over the Jew for a period. And it would culminate in the Messiah coming to set up his kingdom. So where are we at at this point? Let me just give you a quick summary. Matthew's genealogy is constructed to introduce two themes. Those themes are Jesus fulfilling the promises given to David, Jesus fulfilling the promises given to Abraham. David's name is listed first in verse 1 because Jesus came to the Jew first and their king offered a kingdom to them in fulfillment of that covenant. Abraham's name is listed second because after the Jews rejected Jesus and rejected the kingdom, then he turned to the Gentiles and began to fulfill the Abrahamic covenant for their sake. To the Jew first, and then it went to the Gentile. We're going to see Matthew develop these themes as we go through his gospel. One last thing to observe. Notice how he ends. How he ends this genealogy in verse 16. He describes Joseph as the father of Mary by whom Jesus was born. Now he doesn't call Joseph... Jesus' father, which makes sense, right? We know that Joseph was not the biological father of Jesus. Almost anyone who's been in church even a, a day or two or gone through a Christmas season knows that we have a virgin birth story for a reason, right? We'll go into that a little later. If you notice down the page a little bit in chapter 1, we're going to repeat Christmas here very soon. So if you didn't get enough of it last month, don't worry. We're going to do it all again. Mary was a virgin. So although Joseph assumed legal responsibility for this son, he adopted him basically, he was not the biological father. And therefore, while Jesus was Joseph's heir, he was not his descendant. He was Joseph's heir, but not his descendant. He only shared a physical relationship with his mother, with Mary. And as you look at Mary's genealogy in Luke's gospel, you'll find Mary also descended from King David. Both Mary and Joseph traced their ancestry back to David. So Jesus is an heir to the throne through Joseph and a biological descendant of David through Mary so that he meets all the terms that were required for him. So now, if Mary's genealogy was enough to support the claim that Jesus was descended from David, why does Matthew want us to know that Jesus was not physically related to Joseph? Wouldn't that actually work against his argument? Wouldn't it seem to suggest maybe that he's not connected to David? Remember, we only have Matthew's gospel to begin. We don't have Luke's for a little while. Why did he want us to know that there was no physical connection between Jesus and Joseph? it actually strengthens his argument that Jesus is the king. Let me show you why. Back in Jeremiah 22, the Lord pronounces a curse on one line of David's descendants, on a king named Jeconiah. God cursed that king because he was so disobedient and evil. And in the curse God puts on Jeconiah, he says this, no one who descends from Jeconiah's line will ever sit on the throne again. If you look at verse 11 in our genealogy, guess who's in Joseph's genealogy? Jeconiah. Which means that if Jesus had been a physical descendant of Joseph, Jesus would have been prevented by that curse from ever occupying the throne. People knew Joseph's genealogy. Like I said earlier, it would have been an easy thing to go to the temple and validate Joseph's genealogy. People have been walking around in Jesus' day or afterwards saying, he can't be our king. His father is descended from Jeconiah. But Matthew preempts that criticism by providing Joseph's genealogy in such a way as to demonstrate he was not a blood relative of Joseph. Joseph was just married to Mary. Through Joseph, Jesus meets the requirements to be an heir. But through Mary, Joseph meets, uh, Jesus meets the requirements to be a physical descendant. And that's an important distinction. Mary's genealogy doesn't go through Jeconiah. Mary's not under that curse. So according to Matthew, Jesus is king and he is savior. Now, a few years ago, there was a Jewish doctor uh, living in the United States on the East Coast. And this doctor was invited to a a church service by a Christian friend. And that Christian friend was suffering from a mysterious paralysis, and he'd been confined to a wheelchair because of it, and no one really knew what was going on. So this man's church decided to schedule a prayer service to pray over him and ask for healing. And so the man invited his family, his friends, anyone he could. And he also invited a work colleague, this Jewish doctor, who had never set foot in a Christian church in his entire life. But because of their partnership at work, he agreed to go. And on the night of the service, this doctor arrived, and he just took a place in a, in a pew, and he sat down, and he just started quietly observing the proceedings. He didn't know what to expect. He didn't know what would happen. And as it was going on, he just tried to follow it. But there came a point near the end of the service where the pastor stood up in front of the whole room, and he said that he was opening the invitation now for anyone 
who wanted prayer to come forward for any reason. And at that moment, and quite to his surprise, this Jewish doctor suddenly felt compelled within himself to stand up and to walk forward in this church. And as he reached the front, he just stopped. With, he didn't say a word. He didn't know what to say. And the elders that were up there waiting for people to come up, they just gathered around him. They just started to pray. They had no idea what his request was. They just allowed the Spirit to guide their intercession, and they just prayed. The whole time that doctor just stood there silently, his head bowed. When they finished, he just returned to his seat. Now, in that moment, that Jewish doctor says that he felt a love he had never known before. It seemed to be everywhere in the room, he said, and in him at the same time. He just sat there in that experience, saying nothing. After the service ended, he just left. He didn't speak to anybody. He didn't tell anyone what he had experienced. And in the days that followed, he just couldn't shake that feeling. He knew something had happened. He just didn't know what it was. And so he began to search for answers. And he searched for someone or something that could explain what he had encountered in that Christian church. He consulted his Jewish friends. Well, they didn't have any answers. He went online. He searched the Internet. Well, that was a bad idea. (laughs) He even called on a Catholic priest at the downtown cathedral, which also turned out to be a complete waste of time. No one could explain his feelings of love and awakening. He hadn't gone anywhere with it from the time he experienced it. So out of ideas, this Jewish doctor ventured into a Christian bookstore and asked for a copy of the Christian Bible. As he tells the story, he says, as he walks up to the counter to talk to the lady, he says, there must be a button under the counter for Jewish doctor in the, in the store because he was like, 15 people came to me immediately and wanted to help me. Now this guy, this Jewish doctor says he, he had been raised on the East Coast in a strict Jewish home, in an observant Jewish culture. He had been taught all his life to despise Christianity, to never look at a Bible. Most Jews, as you may know, have never read the New Testament. And so they imagine that it it has instructions on how to build stained glass buildings and how to kill Jews. I mean, they literally think that's what's in the book, many of them. Because what else would be in the book from their experience? And so as this doctor stared at the bookshelf of Bibles, he couldn't help but feel like he was betraying his heritage. That, that he was about to consult the manual of his enemies. But something inside him, something stronger than the hate, something more compelling than his loyalty, it kept calling him to read it. So that Jewish doctor went home, taking a, a New Testament with him, and he began reading at the very beginning. And what did he find at the beginning of his New Testament? The Gospel of Matthew. And as he read chapter after chapter, his eyes, as he said, opened wider, and his heart began to beat faster, because instead of finding hatred and prejudice against Jewish people, what he was shocked to find was a Jewish story. He found an account of a humble servant sent to Israel with a salvation that's promised to all nations. And at that moment, this Jewish doctor realized Jesus was his Messiah. No human being preached the gospel to this man. The Lord preached it to him. It preached it to him directly through his word, and the Spirit of God brought it to life in his heart. And in that moment, he was born again in faith in Jesus Christ. I'm sharing that story with you. It's a true story. In fact, that same gentleman was later baptized in my backyard pool, which was my honor. But I share that story with you because it powerfully illustrates three unique qualities of the Gospel of Matthew. He wrote his account to persuade a Jewish audience, people like that doctor. You know, Matthew was a Jewish tax collector. You may know this already. He was a man that Jesus called to be his apostle, one of his chief disciples. He wasn't looking for a savior when Jesus found him, but the savior came to him and called him into that relationship. So Matthew sits down and he writes an account and he does it especially for the Jewish readers of his day, men and women who who would have otherwise overlooked Jesus. And here we are 2,000 years later, and his gospel is still reaching Jewish people, like that friend of mine. But it's not just for the Jew, obviously. Matthew's gospel emphasizes the faithfulness of a sovereign God to fulfill his promises to Israel and to the world. He foretold, God foretold everything that happens in this gospel, by and large, that he would carry out all of these things in Jesus' life, and that even Jesus' own death would come in a certain way. All of that is in this work. There's no plan B with God. Everything is plan A. The challenge was trying to explain it to his followers in the moment. That his death wasn't the end of something, it was the beginning. And finally, the most important connection between Matthew's gospel and my friend's story. This account is written to save souls, friends. It's written to bring more of us into the presence of the Lord. 
It's not an ancient historical account. It's not some Jewish version of a campfire story. He didn't write this ultimately to entertain you or to tickle your funny bone or any of that kind of stuff. And if I do that, it's only by happenstance. It's not by intent. This book was written to change your heart. And we study it for that reason. To move someone out of darkness and into the light of the salvation through a belief, through a faith in Jesus Christ as Messiah. Which is what he did for that Jewish doctor because the man opened the book and read it. He discovered a Jesus who died for his sins and was resurrected to give him hope for eternal life. All that we want out of the book as we study it is the same. We want any who hear these words to know the truth of Jesus as Messiah. No matter where you come from, no matter what you've heard about Jesus before, no matter how you have perceived him from what others have said, and for that matter, no matter what you've done and no matter how many mistakes you've made, no matter how bad they are, You have exactly the same reason to come to Jesus as that Jewish doctor did because you recognize this is the one God promised to bring. And that promise is for you. In fact, as many have observed, the worse you are, the more you need Him. The worse your life is, the more mistakes you make, that's not cause to think you're not worthy. That's reason to embrace Him. Because He came for us because we're not perfect. Because you know what the standard for heaven is? According to Paul in Romans 3, it's perfection. It's the glory of God is another way of saying it. Equaling Him. Anybody in here think they're equal to God? Ask your spouse. (laughs) The story of this book, and what we will learn as we study it, is that we too can be forgiven of our sins by a God who sent His only begotten Son to die for that reason. And He lives again so that we know that the death that we'll have in this body is not the end of us. Not if we have faith in Him. That all your sins, everything you've ever done, can be wiped clean by that one sacrifice. That death was all God requires. Our faith in it is enough. So the penalty that God would otherwise lay on you and I, He put on His Son. Friends, I don't know anything better than to embrace at the end of this study tonight than that truth. That Jesus has proven to be both the one who will reign, but also the one who comes to save. He saves first and reigns later. This is the time to receive that free gift. If what you're hearing tonight is news... Or maybe it's not news, but maybe it's for the first time meaningful. Then this is the night that God has appointed for you to have a different relationship with Him. And I'd like to know that before you leave. We're going to end here in one more song as I pray and as the worship team comes up to play and we get ready to dismiss for the night. And I'd like to meet and talk to anyone in this room who's feeling led by what they've heard to talk more about Jesus and how Jesus will save you from your sins. Jesus says that anyone who comes to Him will not be cast out. Come to Him tonight if you haven't already known Him as Messiah. Heavenly Father, Your Word is a lamp. It is a truth, Father, that holds all the wisdom we would ever need for eternity, Father, to know You, to know of You and Your plans for us and for this world. But as much as it has in that arena the wisdom and majesty that we stand in awe of, Father, as big as it is, Father, it is also personal. It is also written to us, and as we saw tonight, Father, it was written to men like my Jewish friend who, in a moment he didn't see coming, was wooed by the Spirit, convinced by your word, and changed by the truth of it. Thank you, Father, for this study. Let us go forward in it, understanding that what we read is true, that the one who wrote it is still alive, and he is calling each of us, Father. If there's those in this room who do not know you and wish to To know you truly, Father, speak to them now and explain the truth as only you can. Call them to repent of what they have followed and to embrace you in faith, Father. Trusting that in doing so, Father, they will receive eternal life and be with you forever as you promised, Father. Let tonight be this night for them. And Father, I also pray you give them the courage to share that news with someone here tonight. For Father, you say that if we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts, that you raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. And we look forward, Father, to hearing a confession tonight, Father. Thank you, Lord, for this evening. Bring many more in the future of this church. And we give all this to you in Jesus' name. Amen.